Recording is on. All right, so today's April 18th, 2021. Uh, continuing our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. And uh, did we all want to continue the discussion from last week about the 2D Ising spin model, mimicry, and all that? Everyone okay? Any questions? Anyone have questions? I found it very difficult to. I think I need the basics to be to be laid back again because uh, it was easy to just suddenly miss some things and you knew what you were talking about. You and the back, my background in physics is not as good as yours, and I found that uh, I can I can understand if it's done slowly. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I like it. I mean, I don't, I don't get me wrong; it's very interesting, but. Uh, yeah, I find it very intuitive because of my background. So it's, it's yeah. It, yeah, it's it's hard for me to understand how anybody could do something like sociology without understanding those kind of yeah. physical models because they really they are the same thing, um, and people just you know talk around the the same points which are mathematical and really well understood in physics. And yes. get really, really fuzzy. If you if you look at Condorcet models and why there are no third parties, or if you look at some sociologist explaining why, um, you know, a swing vote is if you vote for a third party in a two party system, you're throwing away your vote. And they give you know a long essay on explaining why that is, and Condorcet did that too, and, and it, it it's explained very well and easily in in a physical model like with magnetism. You just say like everybody's political orientation, just imagine it's magnetic orientation, and then people compromise. And then the bigger the coalition of compromise, the more strength it has, and they go on recruiting and recruiting, and everybody compromises a little bit more, the biggest coalition wins. So everybody wants to be on the winning side. So they prepared to compromise their position, political position, or likewise the magnetic orientation in an ising spin model so they so if you're not polarized in the in the direction of the your closest domain that's that's neighboring you there's a very strong pull from all that uh, you know coalition that's polarized in exactly the same you know direction so so that's kind of the domain is kind of like a winning team if you're next door to it and you almost agree with the orientation they will swing you over because they're the power base and that's how you know each domain recruits and so it's it's the same in religions it's the same in political parties it's it, there are a lot of things that work in that way ecology everything like that so it's very very fundamental and it's sad that it's known in physics and it's yeah. complete voodoo in in sociology and stuff yeah, uh, so, yeah there, there were i I realized I didn't explain it very well. I, I, there's one thing I didn't explain very well at all. And I, while I was asleep at night, I had a dream and I realized there was a very simple example of what I was trying to say. I realized in my dream and there was, I was trying to say, we were talking about symmetry breaking. And that's the important thing about introducing the Ising spin model because it tends to settle down in very stable domains that are, you know, basically the immovable force uh, meets the irresistible object and they just stay there forever, you know, and that's why you get two party politics that just seems intractable. Um, and so, it, I mean, it does change eventually, but it takes an eon and eon. So in something like climate change or activism or something where we need a, a large change very quickly in the system. Uh, you can't do it this way that everybody thinks linearly. They think like, right. Very obvious. There's a climate emergency, so we must all rally together and you know do green new deals or some you know techno green thing, neon green, fantastic wonder techno whatever. And then they're like, that's obvious. We just need to recruit people to do that, and they all rally forth to do that. And then that's what XR did. Now, they all baffled then when they say, well, how can these idiots not agree with us? And then they go bang, 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 bang. You know, it's like, but. What they don't understand is we're designed, even you know, in our neurology, even down to the very yin and yang of our cells in some ways, is to say that if you put forward a thesis, they will put forward an antithesis. So, so the mere fact 
that that you have this uh, revolution or you propose this revolution, you will get a reaction. It's, it's guaranteed and it's equal and opposite. And then everybody starts tearing their hair out and goes, how can you be so, you know, such a Luddite? And how can you be, you know, so right wing and eco fascist? And surely you realize we should all be vegetarian. It's so duh. <laughs> it's like, and everybody just goes bang, bang, bang. So you can't win in that way. You'll reach stalemate. And that's, we can't afford stasis. We can't afford deadlock in a system where we need change. So I would say any change is good. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get too picky. It's. It's more important that one side wins outright, either side, than to make sure the right side wins. Because <laughs> because the worst thing possible is business as usual. The worst thing possible is staying on this course. So anything that breaks symmetry is good. I wouldn't get too fussy. Is it communism, fascism, whatever? <laughs> you just need change. You just hope that basically change will do it. But you, since you know absolutely that if there's not change, we're screwed, then it's just like, don't get fussy. Just go for change. So, okay, so how do you get change in a system that's designed to be conservative? Um, you know, our psychology, our neurology is, de is designed to be conservative. So what I was proposing is that you have to cheat. <laughs> you have to get some enlightened people to cheat. So you you have to do a false flag thing. You, the only way you can uh, really get the system to shift one way or another is to uh, use deception. And and I, I said this and I realized I didn't describe it very well. Here's the example that I suddenly realized in a dream at like two in the morning. I thought, oh, God, I should have thought of that. It was uh, Braveheart. So do you remember the Braveheart movie with Mel Gibson? And the... And he applied Sun Tzu to totally in that, in that yes. deception. Totally. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the deception, the details? Yes. Okay, well, I better go through it. Just go, 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 go through it. It's brilliant. So, so yeah. So, so what happened was, and I believe this is historically correct. But if you remember back to that movie, Bra Braveheart, Mel Gibson, there, and you remember the, the before the big battle that Mel Gibson and all the blue faced Charlies lost. There's the crux of the basically the high point of the movie, really, is where Robert the Bruce goes to his old dad, who's like this you know, kind of straight out of Harry Potter, really. I mean, it's not um, Lord of the Rings, so a bit, a bit of a Smeagol like character, this old guy, you know, but really Machiavellian and worldly wise. And he says to Robert the Bruce, he says, like, you have to go over to the English side. And basically, that's how we will survive. That's how the Bruce's will. And I believe it's correct. I mean, correct me on my history here, but I believe the Bruce's eventually became the Jacobeans and James's court. They did actually take over England. So that old guy was absolutely right. But now what happened was then they all arrive on the battlefield. There's, you know, Mel Gibson and his crowd and Robert the Bruce and all these clans come down on their side. Now, you the the high point of the battle, they switch sides. So that's what I was talking about, is you have to go down. Now, now think it through. You might think, well, Robert the Bruce was a real bastard. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you might think, well, why didn't he just not turn up to the battle? Then the English would have been in the majority. Mel Gibson would have, would have been a bit stumped. He said, no, he has to turn up to the battle. Because, as I've said many times before, wars are really to resolve uncertainty. Nobody goes to battle if they think they're going to lose. So this is something that, that America is extremely bad. And I rate the Mer American military very, very, very low in my estimation. And one of the reasons is they never understand this point about a measure and restraint. And, uh, and all. they just think we, we're going to be the biggest, toughest asshole on the block, million, you know, nuclear missiles. And then basically, you know, we're the biggest, uh, if we're the biggest, baddest guy, we're the biggest club, we rule. Say, no. Because no one will engage you head on. So again and again, they never learn this. They go, they go to Vietnam and get their ass kicked. Why? 
because no one will offer them the battle that they want. They want like, you know, you're a coward. Come out and let me beat you to death should be the motto of the American forces. I mean, it goes all the way back to Custer. They, America hasn't learned fucking things since Custer. Custer went out against the, the Native Americans and it frustrated the hell out of him because he had the superior force. So he couldn't get the the, the Native uh, Americans to engage, of course, because he was going to crush them. So he kept on pushing and pushing and pushing, trying to get the decisive battle that would then, you know, eliminate the tribal system. He got his wish, but, but only when they had everything in their favor. So they led him on, strung him out, divided his forces. He got more and more desperate for a set piece battle. But when it came, he didn't. He had, uh, you know, he lost because he didn't have superiority, <laughs> battlefield superiority. So, so the same thing happens in 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 like Vietnam. It's like you know, there's the hugest military known to man. There's never seen anything. So you go into Vietnam, you're guaranteed. If you go into battle with such a big array that no one is going to challenge you, you 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 guaranteed an insurgent war. It's it's America thinks oh you know everybody's just going to disappear and not have a war. <laughs> it's like you're not that scary. <laughs> you're just scary enough for them not to to basically do an insurgent war. So you, so the same thing happens again in Iraq. They have this huge amount of armor and stuff. They roll into Iraq and they go, yeah, mission accomplished. All this is like, you're so damn stupid. Of course, Saddam is not as dumb as you. He's going to basically disappear exactly what he did. And then well, after you've done all the big victory parades and mission accomplished, then they're going to come out and get you. And then, you know, when everybody's gone home and, you know, basking in the glory of their wonderful victory, that's when they're going to come out and you're going to have a war that you cannot handle. And that's an insurgent war. And eventually you get to Fallujah and you get your ass kicked <laughs> because you didn't have the men and the material. And so it happens to America again and again. They never learn this, this, uh, this idea of proportionality, restraint. What, what America should do is have, have a massive army that's secret. They should play it down, pretend they're Sweden, pretend, pretend, pretend that basically they're completely neutral and isolationist. And then when, you know, something pops up in the Middle East or Iran or something, then they should go to war and then Iran will be like, oh, you know, America's military is puny. We'll easily take it on. Then you can roll in and, and, and defeat them. But what, all I'm saying here is that war is to resolve uncertainty and America is the American military uh, spent, America spends so much on the military, it's more than the next five. I, in fact, I think it's more than everybody else in the world combined. So, so the mere fact that they do that means that they're not going to get the war that they want. <laughs> it's guaranteed because there's no uncertainty. No one is stupid enough to go and fight the war you want. So, so okay, so then what that means in practice is is that somebody like Robert the Bruce has to go down to the battlefield. He has to pretend that he's in alliance with, you know, Braveheart. Because if he didn't appear on the battlefield, then Braveheart would go, shit, we've got half the forces we need to actually defeat the English. He wouldn't he wouldn't appear on the battlefield. So so you ha so it has to be like an Ising spin model. What Robert the Bruce is saying is, I'm oriented with you, Braveheart. And then at the final moment, when you're just about to have the decider, then it's like, oh, tricked you, <laughs> and you're on the other side. And then that's how you, you get away. And it's the same applies in what XR is trying to do or something like that. So let's take a, a ridiculous example, but it will prove the point. You say, OK, so say you XR and you want a green revolution and you know you, you think that the climate thing can be solved with politicians doing solar panels and wind, wind farms or something. So you think it's all about a Green New Deal and you can transform the system and make it regenerative and, stay, and sustainable stuff. And then, well, who's the opposition to this? Well, the incumbents, big oil, entrenched cement interests, the entrenched uh, everything in, in, involved in the global capitalist economy is, is a, your enemy. 
apart from all the guys that think they can make a mint out of green tech. So you so then if you if you don't understand this kind of Wu Wei thing, then you would say, well, we've got to get the green billionaires on our side because then we'll have all of them. We'll get the press on our side and then we'll wage war against all the moneyed interest. And he was like, well, this is a static set piece battle. We need neither side can win. If you are really smart, what you'd do is you'd say, you would halve your force. You would say, okay, these are all the rebels. You'd get half the rebels to pretend they were in the camp of big oil. They would promote all the worst things and stuff and basically be seen to be leaders in that field. So you say the leaders against greenism. And then at some point, you know, big oil would fund you. And at some point, then you capitulate and say, you know what? We had an amazing mistake. We've had an epiphany. You, you know, basically, as soon as something like a really bad headline came out or a really bad report or something like that, and then you would, you would capitulate. And then in that capitulation, the green side has won. So if you can pretend to be the other side, like fossil fuel industry, uh, and, and be the leader in the opposition, you also, if you're the leader in the opposition, you also get, um, you know, better people freeload, right? So everybody freeloads. If somebody is doing the battle for you, they don't appear in the field. They basically just, they'll chuck a bit of money at you, you know, sponsor you a bit and say, oh, go for it. You'll, you'll get lots of encouragement from the sidelines, a few dollars, if you fight somebody else's battle. So the stingy capitalists would, would, easily just give you money, completely step down and let you fight their battle for them. And then when you capitulate it, it would be too late. After you have the tears and capitulation and everybody has the reconciliation and it all gets very primate brained and you all pat each other on the back, it's too late for the oil industry to come in then and say, wait, 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 we haven't started fighting yet. Those guys were fake. And it's like, no, the show's over, dude. You, you, if, if psychologically, the win is done and people psychologically have gone through the catharsis of the whole thing and stuff. They fact, they can't start the battle then. If, if you want to know a battle that's really, really, really hard to start, have one that's already finished, that everybody is reconciled with. In other words, go to South Africa now after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and try and get the battle started again. You will be shut down so firm and fast by everybody you'll never show. So that's that's the position you put the enemy in. You say the battle's already lost. And he's like, but, but we haven't begun to fight. And he's like, well, we did the fighting for you and we lost. <laughs> and it's like they had, they completely had. So it I I hope I make this point clear is that this is the way you do symmetry breaking. This is, I'll give you another example. I've never actually done this to somebody, but some guy, I, a friend I, I had who was in this in the realm of you know martial arts and um you know special forces and ways to kill people <laughs> he, he told me the, the quickest and easiest way to kill somebody is you say like in a you know barehanded you know say in a bar fight or, or in you know combat is you, in hand-to-hand -hand combat you, say, you just put your hand your left hand behind the, the guy's neck and you, you put your right hand like you would think on his jaw and you push, you know, towards, towards his right, like that. And then just when you get to the right, you rip it the other way, you snap his neck like that. And the reason is because if you're in a fight and you push somebody in this way, they, they will fight against you. So when you snap it back the other way, he breaks his own neck. You barely have to put any effort into it. And that that is the principle of Wu Wei. That's the the you know in Sun Chu and the art of war and stuff is is to to make the enemy defeat themselves. So you have to basically get the thrust of where they're going and make that be the, the downer. So you have to think in terms of that in, in terms of the the enemy in terms of like technomania, technomania solutions and stuff. Is you should really drive those to their logical conclusion and quickly. So take something like geoengineering and stuff, which would be absolutely fatal. 
You don't want to suppose geo. You'll never oppose geoengineering. They're not going to have a referendum. You're not going to be asked. These guys are billionaires. They will do it on their own. You, you're not going to get a look in. So, so the smart thing is to propose it and to propose it very badly so that it fails. You, you, you really want to propose, propose geoengineering so much that it's an embarrassment for people like psychopaths like David Keith and those guys. You want, you want them to be embarrassed and go, oh, ooh, um, maybe you're overdoing this a bit. We wouldn't go that far. No, 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 let us handle it. We for geoengineering. Like, <laughs> it's like when they're getting nervous, then you know you're on the right track. And when you, when you say you funded, if you were a green billionaire or something and you funded some disaster deliberately to make it fail, and then you go, guys, this is not working. This is a disaster. You can make the theater of collapse and collapse of the idea and make a theater out of capitulation. And you could stop geoengineering in its tracks. But if you just raise placards and go nya, 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 and try and shame them and nag them and you know, or use all these kind of female tactics too, it's like it's not going to happen. These green billionaires are not your husband. You're not going to nag them out of the, the pet project. And the pet project is, um, is a life-sustaining causes to eat project. It's, a, it's, it is their vehicle for immortality. You're not going to nag them out of it. You're not going to hold up, you know, have pink pussy parades or do pussies in boats on the high street. And it's not going to happen. In fact, you're almost making it happen. You, 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 in, in also in terms of Wu Wei, your opposition is also necessary for their legitimacy. So take, for instance, COP26. Now, XR and all these rampant idiots, they will go to COP26 and oppose it. Worst thing you could possibly do. COP26 is designed to, to stall climate action. And there you're going, legitimizing. You see, if you didn't turn up and then you didn't have XR there with all the you know banner drops and placards and stuff, it, it would be as lame as shit. But they wouldn't have a COP27 because <laughs> basically they would be exposed. You'd say, like, we don't care about you. You're irrelevant. COP26 is a sham. And you, you proved it by not turning up. And basically, you know, if, if anybody, the media tried to present all the, the outcomes from it or something, you know, you just basically that's what you need to jump on. So don't talk about it. We don't want to hear about COP26. It's a, it's a scam. And so just try and shout down anything that comes out of COP26. So try and get it so you can't have a COP27. Now you're getting somewhere. But otherwise, you, you pro, you're legitimizing it. So, yeah. Okay, so that was one of the things I wanted to, to mention. Is, it, is this all making any sense before? Yeah. So, yeah, okay, so I'll tell you. My uh, only concern talk. would be, um, like, let's say you're in the op opposed opposition. Um, would it take some psychological will to not get enticed by money, sex, fame, all that stuff? Or do you can you not yes. even be in that camp? Or how would you? Yeah. yeah. Yes. You see, this is the danger. Is this is the danger in all these things? It's all psychology, right? This is if if you you see people like to frame it in something that's manageable for them to control. So you get the geeks. They frame it in terms of an engineering problem because that gives them control. They're geeks and then an engineering thing is something they can deal with. So then they will frame a complex problem that has nothing to do with engineering, like climate change, in terms of engineering, in terms of geoengineering, in terms of financial engineering, all these kind of engineering. Why? Because that is their domain of control, or they think it is. It's not really. <laughs> they, they don't know their own subject, but that's a topic for another day. But, the, but in, in their minds, they can get control if the alien cortex frames it in, in um, a game that they can play. Again, it's like the, the US military. They, they get caught up in their own bullshit because they make an army that is invincible in the game they want to play. So, so the, the reason why America never evolved from, since Custa, the armed forces haven't evolved their psychology since Custa, is because they stuck in a frame that they control. If the military mindset and a general in the military 
you know, is, is they they guys that have control issues. They they become officers because they want control. And so by the time you get to a psychopath like Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, or something, he's dripping the control psychopathy. And the the that what it means is that they have a need to get control. This is why these people are the most dangerous people you can have in collapse. Because that need for control, then they cannot see beyond that. They, 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 everything is interpreted in that way. So if you look at Rebecca Solnit and stuff and see what happens in collapse situations, to, my, to the brain of Mike Pompeo is these people are looting Walmart. So any sane human being was saying like, there's baby formula and water in a fucking shop that's closed. A warehouse, what, what they're supposed to leave it there? Of course not. They're going to break down the door and get the fucking baby formula out of the Walmart. Are you stupid? Well, if you might Pompeo, that's looting. <laughs> and he would say, get the military in there, and they've got to shoot to kill. Stop these looters and gain, gain us back, uh, you know, our city. You, you'll never stop that tape in their head. And so they're very, very dangerous because, you know, they accumulate power in, to the limit of, of sense, uh, you know, in terms of thousands and thousands of nuclear warheads and stuff. Dr. So, Strangelove, Dr. Strangelove thin scenario, exactly. It, it, exactly. <laughs> if, if you look at, you see, that's Stanley Kubrick was, was sending up those guys. But Dr. Strangelove was actually um, von Neumann, <laughs> who is one of the arch cyberneticists and guys that wanted control. So Stanley Kubrick was taking the piss out of, um, out of von Neumann. And uh, even even the guy that went down was uh, you know the, the 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 guy who rode the atomic bomb all, all the way down at the, at, at the end. That's General Curtis LeMay. So th those the, that's uh, the head of Strategic Air Command, and th their whole idea was that basically you'd be so overwhelming in force that nobody can resist. The the problem is then is. Uh, you're doomed in so in so many ways. With uh, also from what you're saying, Mike, and that's you're doomed from your own self, right? And what what generally happens with these kind of control freaks is when they lose control, they then there's this monstrous table flip and you know rail against the world. So they will they on their you see. They have this very positive mindset up until the time they're defeated. When they're defeated, they go like the proverbial scorpion stinging itself to death. But that stinging itself to death, they will take everything they love, the whole world, <clears throat> everything will go down with them. They'll take it down. They will do as much destruction as they can out of spite and revenge. So that, that personality type is so fucking bad. It's just unbelievable. I, I could say right now, if anybody's listening, when we get into trouble, we'll go around and pop each one of those guys, a cap in the back of the head. You will be saving millions of lives and so much. If, if you, if, I would say so much that you should infiltrate these organizations, make sure you get close to the top, just so you're close enough to pop a cap in the back of the head in, in, when, when it winds up in one of these hot situations. That's the best thing you could do for the environment and for the world. If you, is just be sure that you are standing behind these guys when that moment happens and you armed <laughs> or know how to do a little <laughs> maneuver like that. So, yeah, I can't say that enough. Those are your biggest problem, and it's coming. I mean, if, if I'm wrong and there's no collapse and there's all hunky doo da and Bill Gates rules the world and Charles Schwab has a one world order and it's all happy and we're all solar panels and stuff, then it's like, yeah, okay, no harm done. But that, that isn't the way it's going to go down, I'm telling you now. That's not the way it's shaping up. So, so. Yeah, I, I'm just saying this is the psychology. Anyway, so if, if that's all clear, then then I'd like to just mention, since we're on strategic and symmetry-breaking strategies, I, I don't think, is anybody, does anybody like this military stuff? I, I'd like to tell you a bit more about it, if, if, no, if it's meaningful to anybody, but I'll stop if it's not meaningful. Well, I mean, I'm, I, I'm just, 
discovering something that is absolutely, as a woman, completely not in my realm again, but I'm always happy to learn. And uh, well, my time will come to teach you other things, maybe. But it's interesting. It's very useful. Um, you know, I read Sun Tzu um, at, an early, at a young age, and my father made me read uh, the memoirs of Napoleon and the memoirs of de Gaulle when I was a child. And I was like, okay, well, it, it stayed with me. And I translated the Benum Gallicum and I, the Anabazas of Zenoff. And I learned about the big battles of the world and the history of our ancestors. So, no, it's, it's, it's very important. We can't deny that, that, that part of, of strategy in life. It's no, and I, I've been drawn to martial arts for another reason, not at all, but, yeah, no, it's education. Thank you. Yes, do, do. I mean, unless somebody really doesn't want to yeah, hear about it. I like it. It's good, good stuff. Okay, so, so let's talk about Napoleon then and, and symmetry breaking since you bring him up. So Napoleon was, was very good at uh, symmetry breaking. So, so and, and this is worth studying because it tells you the difference between, you know, logistics, military tactics and psychology and and war is all psychology so they, they will tell you oh you know it's who gets to the battlefield with first with the most and all these kind of things it's it's true but it's the guys have a very limited understanding that that, that have that level of understanding if if you get to better practitioners of war yours they will get closer and closer to where it's all psychology in fact if you're going to win uh and be non-violent. So if you're gonna have a win with the least deaths and the most, uh, the, the most efficiency in the, in the least time, it's a psychological win. So it's the, it's the only, it's basically, it's the only way to win. You can't, even, even military tactics and force of martial, um, uh, force of arms, is still only psychology, and so you know you can't you can't shoot everybody <laughs> that, that disagrees with you. You you have you have to win over hearts and minds, and so then as soon as you realize that, then you're in a different territory, and the the you have to be a psychologist. Now, what Mike pointed out there is. You have to know yourself. So you, you can't do this thing which Hallam is trying to do. is like, well, we haven't got time to do all this bullshit stuff, so we're just going to do this end run around all the obstructive left. We're going to get to the big power base, which is all these you know clueless liberals, and then we're going to get 3.5%. 3.5%, we all know from Erica Chenoweth, that then is, you know, as soon as you've got 3.5% of the population on your side, then according to the spreadsheet, the military and police forces come over to your side and you defeat the government. As soon as you defeat the government, then you do the right thing. It's like, this is so fucking clueless. I can't even begin to tell you. So the, the I mean, I mean, the, it just doesn't work like that at all. It's just, you cannot be more clueless than that picture. I mean, that is the base level stupidity. It's just more than face palm. It's not even wrong. It's so wrong. So uh, let's start and pick it a bit. It's like the first thing is where's the psychology? There's it's all it's almost devoid of psychology. It's it's devoid of insight into what goes on into those case studies that Chenoweth and Eric whatever is Pierce or whatever his name is, is is those guys did a very very shallow analysis. They're very superficial ivory tower. Guys, they, they know nothing of tactics. They know nothing of psychology. Sun Shu is just a weird word to them. Then it, it, it's, you, you just, uh, they, they, yeah. The only thing I think they were there for is to just divert resources and make people nonviolent. So the, so, okay. So uh, when you look at psychology, so once you got it and you realize the, the, the best win, if you, you know, the aim is to be nonviolent, but not make a fetish out of it because you're going to have to, a lot of people are going to die if somebody tries to be pacifist. So, you know, don't bring Gandhi and stuff into it. Gandhi was a, was a fake. <laughs> and it, it's not, it's, again, Chenoweth was making all these uh, false, um, false references. 
because what Gandhi in India was, uh, he he had to be pacifist because Britain was trying to leave India. So if he had really done any opposition, uh, violent opposition, he would have likely aroused all the imperialist juices in the population in Britain. It would have been completely counterproductive. He, so you can't take Gandhi's such uh, Satyagraha as uh, as a lesson. And when you look at Satyagraha today, it's it, Gandhi's a criminal. <laughs> he's just he, and he's misled people. Look look at that dam where you that thing we po posted about that dam. I can't remember what the dam's called now in India. And so all these guys, you know. All the villages are being flooded. These guys are lives are being ruined. They're not standing up to these psychopaths. And the reason is Satyagraha. They're following Gandhi. So Gandhi has is, is perpetrated a great evil on the world. And the, the evil is putting putting nonviolence on a pedestal and making an idol out of it. So nonviolence and violence are strategies, they're tactics. It's it's desirable to have nonviolence because because that that's a more efficient win. But in many cases, violence is the is the most uh, the shortest path to victory, especially if you can terrorize people. So terrorism is is a great strategy for minimizing harm because if you can if you can kill one guy and terrorize hundreds, like Mao Zedong, so it's just like kill one, scare a million. So now you'd say, well, what a bastard. Well, the options are is to kill hundreds of thousands by doing hunger strikes or letting the fascists run all over you or whatever. It is actually very efficient to kill one and scare a million. So, you know, you cannot make an idol of it. We're never going to kill anybody. We're never going to shoot anybody. Is that, well, a lot more people are going to die than is necessary. So... You can't make a religion out of nonviolence. Although it is a goal, nobody wants to be a bastard. But in a lot of ways, if you go up against psychopaths, they decide it's not your prerogative to decide how the battle goes down. They they decide how it goes down. And they, they've already decided. If you look at Apocalypse Now, they've decided that it's going to be a fight to the death and it's going to be violent. And you say, okay, it's you see, if you're the person that's actually proposing the the rebellion, you don't get to choose the weapons the other side. It's like a duel. It's like a, a duel in more enlightened times before we got so dipshit stupid as we are in the 20th century. Um, they used I, to had, fight duels. I had a conversation with some Quaker friends of mine. I've got quite a few friends that are living nearby and about their, their, their religion is based on nonviolence. And you say you must make a religion out of nonviolence. This is a no-go area for them in history you know they are very it's a uh, it's very difficult um I, I have a lot of respect for them and for what they do they've done a, you know in general but um there's a yeah there is a religious aspect to it that's disturbing well if you if you look at the track record of non-violent people in history it's not good basically all the men of peace die like gandhi himself got shot so you say like that's what you if you want to get shot be a man of peace. Yeah. Jesus and got put up on the cross. It's like, don't get put up on the freaking cross. <laughs> that dam in India was the Narmada. Narmada. What was it? Nar. Um, yeah, that Narmada dam. Yeah. Yeah, Narmada dam, and yeah, there was a lot of um, subsistence farmers. They were living in these villages close to the river, and the thing is, um, they were they were just gonna stay there. They they wanted to die rather than live elsewhere but the um police or the government didn't even want that they instead of they were literally almost um uh, head deep like they really wanted to drown in the water but they were arrested put in prison and then they said okay you guys go go do whatever you want um but don't die like <laughs> so yeah it's not a good yeah. So, so the, that drowning yourself in the water is such a graha. So such a graha means taking the violence on yourself. So it is. So it's an it's an egotistical, because if you're not egotistical, then you think, well, we you can be more consequential and say we're going to apportion out the violence. 
So G Gandhi is not nonviolent. He he is doing what they would say in German or Afrikaans is self murd It means self murder. So he's not to say oh he's not uh, he's avoiding murders. No, he's killing himself. So if a less egotistical person would say the aim is that. No one dies as them, least man possible. But they are saying, if you take on all the evil of the world and the aggression and take on all the psychopathy of the world, project it on yourself like a Christ life sacrifice, then at some stage you will reach their humanity. You will suck out all the evil and, you know, you will absorb it like the cancer of the world. This, and is, this is narcissism. It's narcissism. It's it's. It's pure, utter, egotistical, horseshit narcissism. It's evil. Gandhi is evil. He is the epitome of evil. Because, because of this narcissistic uh, analysis of it, it's, it's basically he, he is a psychopathic, narcissistic messiah. He has a messiah complex. Just the idea that you can take on the world's psychopathy, absorb it, and you know, until you've sucked out all the madness out of people, and then the only humanity will be left. Just that is so arrogant, conceited. It's it's vile. You should go and topple Gandhi's statue. That's enlightened. But any slave owner is better than Gandhi because they don't have that ego. That ego is that ego is the essence of the world. The essence of the world's evil is that, and Gandhi's dripping with it. So, so the yeah, I hope people understand that it's the vilest thing known to man. But aside, it's also just completely horseshit naive. Is psychopath will uh, is like a sadist. They will feed you all their psychopathy and generate more. It's an infinite supply. So, so Gandhi is completely wrong in that he can suck the, the hatred and psychopathy out of Hitler. Hitler said to Lord Kermagen, he, sa he said, why don't you just shoot the bugger? <laughs> and they said, well, no, we can't do that, blah, 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 and stuff. You see, Gandhi was very lucky he came up against the British. If he came up against Hitler, no one would have heard of him. He would have lasted three seconds. They would have topped him. He would have gone nowhere. He wouldn't be famous. So he's famous because not because he's brilliant and such a graha and the superiority of nonviolence. It's basically because the English were nice guys. <laughs> if the English were nice guys, you wouldn't have heard about him. Yeah, but let's be honest. We all fell for Gandhi. I mean, when I was young, you know, everybody, all oh, Gandhi, the stories, the legend. The, you know, when you don't look deeper into psychology and into what we're talking about. I mean, I must say, I was, you know like plenty of people around me and maybe some people here in the group and it's 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 amazing that when you go deeper into those mythical images of people that we have met through our lives to to, well, to realize that the, the <laughs> to realize the extent of of how we we have been uh, brainwashed mm. yeah okay but now we giving gandhi his due he was a great politician and a great psychologist you know in south africa I know all of this because he came from South Africa. <laughs> and if there's one thing you know is that, you know, the charlatans that come from your country, you know. So like Elon Musk, Gandhi, and so they came from South Africa and you know them. You know, you know the, it's basically, there's a part in the New Testament that says a prophet is never accepted in his hometown. That's because they know you full of shit. It's only in other words. So Gandhi comes from South Africa. He wore a suit in South Africa. He's a sleazy lawyer politician. He gets into a loincloth in India. Why? Because then he's making, he's he's developing this narrative and this re, re, weaving this this fiction and the story. So that that is very very good tactics, and it's psyops. It's basically that's what XR and Extinction Rebellion, the whole rebellion, needs to develop psyops. But he's doing a psyops. He's taking control of the narrative, and the narrative works very well in that situation. You can't pluck his story and narrative in his time to those people in political situation and stick it in Trafalgar Square against climate change in 2021. It's just like, guys, it's the wrong story, wrong time. It's, you know, so, okay, so you can pick out universals, but not those. 
but nobody what? wants to hear about that. When you talk to when you talk to people from XR and and in general the general public, it's like you you you're gonna you're toppling one of their idols. You you're just uh, anathema. You're you're breaking a myth. You can't touch Gandhi. Certain people, you know, it's okay, just like. But, but here's <laughs> the thing about uh, about Hallam, is Hallam wanted to you know leave everybody with their you know you leave all the rebels with their ego intact with their, their myths intact with with their false assumptions and idols and ideas and he's saying no no bring all of those they all welcome and then we'll go to the battlefield well no you're fucked with that kind of baggage you're fucked so so Hallam can't do this end run round all the hard work get to all the numbers and then you know launch a rebellion you have to work on the rebels you have to get the rebels ready for battle first so it's it's dual prong thing you have to the rebels have to work on themselves to perfect themselves for battle and then they have to work on the world to win the battle in the world if you like Bu the buddha and you win the battle in yourself or like if you like muhammad he won the battle in, in himself first. He did jihad, personal jihad in himself. If he had just stayed like that, he would have been Job or Jeremiah or some hermit in the mountains in Saudi Arabia. He, he went and after he had defeated himself and his ego, not perfect because he still had this Allah thing, but, but after he did that, then he went and you know, uh, did jihad in the world, you know, basically when, you know, conquering the Arab empire. But you see that you can't, you can't do the Arab empire with these imperfect, idolizing, deluded idiots. They, they cannot, you know, gain an empire. And likewise, you can't have all these silly saints sitting there saying we're perfect and the rest of the world is going to shit. It's like, it doesn't, doesn't matter how wonderful your ochre robe is, you still have to eat in, in climate change. The Arctic does not not going to leave you alone, right? The, if there's habitat destruction and there's no habitat left for you, there's no freaking snow for you to, you know, do your levitation on up in the Himalayas. So you've got to cut that crap out too. But it doesn't, it, neither works. You can't have a perfect soldier and you, you, can't, you can't have, um, you know, basically victory in the world the two go hand in hand and you've got to do the the hard work and the hard work is is psychology and that's what we're doing here for anybody that happens to come across these videos but okay so now that's uh that's one thing but let's get back to napoleon and symmetry breaking because <coughs> that way you brought him up and he's a good mm, he's a very good case in point if you're talking about military strategy, can't do much better than Napoleon. So <clears throat> here's how Napoleon broke military strategy. What his genius was uh, when he first started out. <coughs> By the way, okay, I must say this about Napoleon. If you look at all these guys, these great generals, there's a theme that uh, they all have the moment where they the ego disappears. In, in essence, most of these great men are they walking ghosts. They, they're dead men in their shoes before they even get to the history books. So you, like, there's always a moment uh, you can go back. So for Napoleon, it was the Battle of Lodi. He had, he, I don't, historians who don't understand psychology and, and <laughs> the evolution of, uh, you know, human, uh, the human spirit, they miss this moment pretty much and they don't give it its due but what the what made napoleon and even he said this i'm not making it up <laughs> i think napoleon said this and they don't hear it is is that he said he would have been nothing if it wasn't for the battle of lodi what happened at the battle of lodi was his his horse was shot out from under him he thought he was dead and in 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 many ways he did die he died you see if you, you, if you go into battle as a soldier, especially if you're young and full of piss and vinegar, you think you're invincible and you go into battle stupid because you think you're not going to be hurt. You, you're going to be traumatized because if, you, if you're not wounded, your buddies are, your buddies are taken out. So you get, a, <laughs> you, you get 
a lot of shell shock and PTSD is finding out that you, you're mortal <laughs> the hard way. Now, what happens to guys like Napoleon when they have the horse shot out from under them? In essence, they die. In that moment, they die. They don't care about living or dying after that. You can clearly see a break where they feel they're in kind of bonus time and they feel that the fates collected them at that moment and they are as good as dead. So everything that happens after that is really neither here nor there in terms of their own survival. So they, they become uh, semi superhuman. So the same thing happened to Hitler, right? Hitler was, Hitler was in a trench in World War One. He had a premonition that um, there were, he had a premonition that he should get up. Um, I think he was eating with his, you know, his fellow soldiers. And uh, he had a premonition that he should, he was in imminent danger. He got up and moved away quickly from them. A shell landed on his comrades. And he, he turned into a kind of a Two-Face, you know, from Batman, he, he got half blown up. He lost one testicle. He was, he was really almost like two people. But what happened after that was, was he thought he was, a, he was preserved by destiny. And that's kind of the same thing that happened to Napoleon. But it, it is the shamanic thing that we've been talking about, ego death. It's the same thing that Eckhart Tolle is saying. It's, it's the same thing on Mount Athos. If you die before you die, um, when you... When you die, then you don't die. So these guys are like they died before their time in this moment. So then they then they become great because they don't care. They don't care. What stops other people from being great is they bad at telling the future because they're too vested in the future. They're too vested in the outcome. What clouds people's ability to predict uh, to to prophesy things is they're too vested in the outcome. So they can't see clearly, you know, you, they have uh, ego investment and in, say Bitcoin or gold and silver or green tech or something. And so they can't let go of that. So then they have unrealistic unre expectations for their preferred immortality vehicle like green tech or Bitcoin or whatever. And so you can say to them, like, Bitcoin isn't going to go anywhere. It's a Ponzi scheme. And then it's like they they haven't got uh, object objectivity to agree with you because they're too vested in this thing. And so that's what stops people being good prophets. But if you imagine you're completely neutral, if you already consider yourself a dead man and <laughs> riches, you know, pile of gold in this hand, pile of shit in the other means nothing to you. Then you suddenly get very good at prophesying what's going to happen because you're more objective than the average bear. So objectivity suddenly comes in. You don't care about death. So a lot of the thing is a battle. The psychology of battle is, again, is resolving uncertainty on the battlefield. Resolving uncertainty on the battlefield is, is really deciding who wants this, who wants it badly enough. So if, if either side is, is evenly matched, but one side wants it 10 times more than the other, <laughs> they're going to win. So... It, again, it's to it's to not only you know a battle is not only to resolve the uncertainty in material advantage, it's to resolve the uncertainty in psychological advantage. Now that's why you see in um, you know the uh, Lenny Rivenstahl and the um, the early Nuremberg rallies and stuff with Hitler. Is they, they, you know, Lenny Rivenstahl's thing was called uh, Triumph of the Will, a, you know, famous thing that they get all the clips out of in the Nuremberg rally. And you see, that's what it came out of Schopenhauer and these guys. It was, and uh, Nietzsche a bit. It's, it's the Superman is, they, they had this idea that you had this Elan Vital and this will for life. And whoever has the strongest will for life, it becomes like this Wagnerian superhero, and they're going to win. So they thought of the battle, a battlefield, as deciding who had the superior Wagnerian yen for life, right? And so, so that that is also true, right? But now imagine if you like Napoleon. In a lot of ways, you don't care either way uh, whether you live or die. Um, that is actually a superior position to somebody that actually cares very much. 
um, it's a stronger position. And so that's why, you know, say with ataraxia and stuff, it's a very pure, clean frame of mind, which is disinterested. It means that you're not interested in, in any particular outcome or except a very exalted one like, you know, wisdom or, or something, you know, consciousness or the rightness is all. That's a very exalted uh, motive. It's not, it's not as base as, oh, I don't want to die. <laughs> a guy, a guy that uh, is disinterested to that extent is such a cool fish that they're going to win out over somebody that's, you know, is scared of dying every time. So, so yeah, so that's, that's the, that's the psychology of it. Okay, but let's just go about what, how, how Napoleon broke symmetry. So Napoleon, uh, most battles, again, when you go to battle, you can expect to be the both sides to be evenly matched because as I was saying before, it's to decide decide uncertainty. And if they, both sides weren't even weren't evenly matched, there isn't any uncertainty, so they don't go to battle because nobody really wants to lose. So they don't engage in battle until there is uncertainty. It's almost a rule. So it can be uncertain uncertainty of outcome. So it can you know the, the armies might be hugely asymmetric, but the you know the guerrillas know that they can you know, wear down the other side by attrition or something like that. There's uncertainty in in terms of uh, the ideology of victory. So the path to victory is these guys say, well, we think we can get to victory this way. These guys say we think we can get to victory this way, and the battle is really to work it out because you 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 might think naively, hey, you could save a lot of time and effort. If you went, okay, well, we know all this, so let's be like freaking Gandhi and we'll go down there and say, like, look, we all know this is true. Why don't we just not have this battle because millions of people are going to die and let's not have the battle. What we could do is just say, like, let's stick it in a computer. We will run it in the computer and find out who's right, resolve the uncertainty, then we don't need to die. Basically, and in a way, they did that in, in olden times. So if you look in like the Old Testament, they had uh, champions. So if you say like David and Goliath, that's what the aim was. They came to this conclusion. They say like, well, there's going to be a lot of blood. We're all going to lose the best of our, you know, our best fighters, our best men and, you know, leave widows. Why don't we just say you put up your best champion, we put our best champion up, and they duke it out, and then, you know, one of them dies, but it's like way better. This is way more efficient. And so you, you have to say, well, maybe they would fake it. They would just put, you know, put up David and Goliath, and then David beats Goliath, and they go, ah, just kidding about the champion thing, and then go at it anyway. Well, they didn't because they, they were much smarter than us. <laughs> they, they, they saw things in terms of the omens, and they said, like, if David beats Goliath, it's mystical. And so they, they said, basically, the fates were, were decided. And so, so the, as soon as, like, Goliath is defeated, the, the Hittites or you know, Philistines, I can't remember who they were now, they, they immediately run for it as if they were just defeated in battle. And you say, why? They still got their shields and swords. It's like the only one man down. Say, so, well, no, psychologically, it's tipped the balance. So they broke symmetry that way. It was a very cheap and easy way of breaking symmetry. Now, can you imagine doing that in World War II? You say like, okay, Hitler, give us your best <laughs> Nazi Superman. And in, in a way it was done in the Rocky movies by proxy, you know, the. You get the Russian Soviet guy going up against Rocky, and it it was those nights um, uh, trial by trial by um, trial trial by combat. You know, so we, they did that. It happens sometimes in in air forces. You say the the elites. You get these aces coming up. The two aces go up against each other, and the decider then you know decides much more than just a battle between two aces. It decides the the war. So. But uh, it's really difficult to do it in our day and age where you say, Hitler, you put up a guy and so and you know what would happen if you did this with Americans. The Americans would, they're not mystical enough. And so what they would do is they'd put up some guy, he would get the shit kicked out of him by the Nazi, and then they'd go, 
oh no no well that was a foul oh no no then you'd still go to war <laughs> because they would argue <laughs> so you know the americans are too stupid to, to basically have that level of efficiency but again you you've got to go with the dumbest play on the battlefield and we're super dumb these days so yeah you've got to basically um engage and then what happens is what napoleon found is both armies wind up symmetrical now what Napoleon realized was there's a standard thing in battle tactics and that's defenders defenses a lot more easier than a lot easier than attack so there are various things you know that I wouldn't put too much figures on it but they do I mean military tacticians say you know defense is worth 10 of attack and stuff like that you you know 10 times the strength and they have all these formulas for working out you know how many defenders can beat out an attacking force and there's a large symmetry but let's just say like four to one or something like that okay so napoleon realized this and says well what do you do about that well what he did was he'd drive you know the two armies would meet in in flanks like this he would then put uh his his best attack force in the middle and drive through so basically he would he would drive a spear through the middle of of the enemy so what does this achieve you not a lot because you've got the army so you know your the enemy is separated now into two halves but you've got this long wedge and they could just cut that wedge off and then those guys are sucking so so it's it's not great so far so here's where napoleon had his little brainwave he said like okay what you do is you take the guys on the right flank and they you know they defend us so you you just meet them slightly and hold them still so in other words you make that side static um uh and and just hold it there so that you can just take off enough force so so that really you're making your force a kind of defense against the right flank then you because they're defenders you can take at least half of them away because the fence is easier and you put them on the other flank then you say well now you've got superior numbers on one flank now you might say well he's not really getting ahead because the guys on say the left flank they also can do the same thing where they just basically do a defensive defensive line and then the fact he has more you're not really getting ahead this way Right. If you think of it in terms of like go strategy and all the pieces on the board, he's di he's divided the two. Great. He's got one side pinned down. He's moved more forces to the other side, but the other side can just so just be defensive. And stuff. How is the symmetry breaking? It's symmetry breaking because of the psychology. See, he used a lot of psychology in. Uh, you see, on the left side, the guys are defeated in their minds because they go like. How can this guy, you know, the, they, they, they formulated the idea when they meet on the battle side that we even. So they arrive there and they're full of gusto because they say, we can take on Napoleon. We evenly matched. And that's what the, the officers will tell them. And, oh, they'll give him a rousing thing saying, we evenly matched. We can do this and we better train, blah, blah, blah. And so the guys come in, both sides come in with a lot of chutzpah. What Napoleon has to do is override the psychology of the rah-rah that the officers gave to the men. The easy way to do it is <laughs> you've got a lot more guys against you, making a lot more headway. And at some point, you, you go, hang on, this is not right. There are a lot more guys than us, and they're beating the shit out of us. And then that left side capitulates. But only psychologically, in terms of material and stuff, it's a non-starter. They're still even. Napoleon has just defeated them uh, by, you know, smoke and mirrors and effect. Now, he, he, it, wasn't, he, it wasn't quite that simple. He also had a lot of tricks under his lead. As he went on, uh, the, the opposing armies learned his tricks. So he got less and less effective because, you know, they, they began to duplicate what he was doing. So when, when he started out his career, uh, war was very gentlemanly and it was all, you know, done in the daylight and people would maneuver to the battlefield wait for the other side and it, it was all rather sporting and 
Napoleon was a shit. He just said, like, I oh, forget this. I'm going to march in the rain. I'm going to attack at night. And all, all these, the opposing armies were defeated. But they said, like, you're so fucking stupid. They said, why are you behaving like an arsehole? Because all you make, you're just making war shit. And Napoleon was like, I don't care. I have a bigger ideal. I want, you know, the code Napoleon. And I want revolution. So I don't care about your, I'm not here to be a gentleman and play sport with you. I'm here to win. And yeah, it took the guys a while, but they said, okay, if you want to play dirty, we can too. And as soon as they started playing dirty, yeah, war got shit. <laughs> so they were right in a way. But anyway, the, uh, so the tricks, the psychological tricks that Napoleon played with as he went along, um, armies that got defeated by him, they studied the patterns and realized what, what he was doing. One of the things he did was build up a narrative and reputation. One of the things he built up was that um, he would hold back the Praetorian Guard, you know, the, the, the best, the elite soldiers uh, were the Imperial Guard. So they would, but he, he would hold them back out, out of, um, in reserve, hold them in reserve. And then, um, he established in the minds of all the armies in Europe that when he he was when he was won, when he had won the battle, he would send in the Praetorian Guard. Now that was a very valuable bluff, because when he but when you see in the mind every soldier on the battlefield, every enemy soldier on the battlefield knows that. Things are not looking great, but if the Napoleon sends in the Praetorian Guard, it means the battle's over and we've lost. So that gave him another edge because he he could actually be losing the battle and he could bluff them by sending them in and they'd go, oh, I thought we were winning, but Napoleon sent in the Praetorian Guard. It means we're fucked. Out of here. So, uh, but anyway, uh, okay, I'm trying to paint a few things here. One of them is that... Symmetry is broken by psychology, and you, you've got to do psyops. Um, and yeah, um, and yeah, maybe also it's the the triumph of the will is is no mistake. It's at some stage you 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 know everybody's slowly working their psychology towards you know the seriousness of the planetary situation, but at some stage you've got to come to the conclusion that it really is serious and then you have to give up all your idols and all your beliefs and stuff like that and then you you know then you're ready for battle saying that you know you really have to decide do you have the will to save the planet if save the ecology and the life that's left on this planet it isn't everybody knows that it's an all-out battle. It's kind of getting a bit apocalyptic and stuff. And so, so we all know that everything's at stake. Now, it's just a question of getting through the psychology. Of, you've got to go through all this, like, well, oh, perhaps solar panels will save us. Oh, no, okay, that won't work. Perhaps this, perhaps that. And you've got to whittle through all this denialism and, and stuff. And eventually people go like, okay, we're really at death ground. And death ground is is where you say, okay, this is it. You really have to decide, do you have, do you want the living world to survive? And you say, at that point, that's the turning point. You say, we're going to have to go all out. And then that, it's, it's a question of who wins is who gets to that point first. So it's, that, that is a goal to get to. So the, it's very important for these movements and that to destroy people's hope. Because hope, hope is poisonous. Hope is stopping people getting to the point where they're on death ground. So what death ground is, is, is Sun Tzu uh, in the Art of War and stuff. It's, it's well known in battle that you can set up a situation where your side has the greater will to win. So most, most, most people in most armies, they don't want to be there, right? It's, it's, they would rather be anywhere else than on this battlefield. No, I mean, a few nutcases want to be there. And, and if, and the long, longer you stay there, you can get into a situation where the battle becomes a drug. And so the, those guys are a little going, going a little soft upstairs. But, the, but the, um, in, in general, the, the 
in any battle, the vast majority of people in the field don't want to be there, and they they not um, they kind of lukewarm. But you 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 can you can steal their resolve by putting their backs up against a wall, and so that's that's what generals would often do to their own troops. So you know. In general military tactics, they'll tell you, well, you don't want to burn your bridges. You, you don't want to have your back to an obstacle where you're cornered. You want to be able to have an escape route. But you see, what generals realize, the reason why we have the expression burn your bridges in the English language was from Romans. So the, the Romans, particularly, I think Caesar, <laughs> he enjoyed this, is, is what you do is real psychopath stuff, but this is the way it's done, is you, you take your your army across um, a death obstacle like a river over these bridges and then you burn the bridges and you say guys check behind you see all those bridges you just crossed see them all going up in smoke this is it you either win or you die where you stand and the guys go you fucking bastard caesar he said yeah aren't i but you're gonna win now now think of the other side approaching them they, they're like, damn, I hope I live through this experience. And they got, these guys are fighting like tigers, like cornered rats. So you know those guys are going to win. So if the guys like Caesar, they have to be careful. They'd have to be careful that they, 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 it was a psychological tipping point. And, you know, it, it, it means that you're all in. They just get all their chips, stick them on the table and say, beat me now. <laughs> and most opposing armies wouldn't be that committed so you'd you'd win so so in terms of like fighting for the planet it's it's the battle's not going to start until people realize they're on death ground they have too many options now they have too many feints and excuses we are on death ground we're further than death ground but the all the the kids in the field they don't realize it yet they they know it but they won't admit it yet. They're not admitting it to themselves, right? So it's at some point, shit will get real. The problem is in this situation that by that stage, the tipping points in the climate are gone. <laughs> so we're in an unusual situation. But uh, uh, rebel leaders in terms of the environmental movement should be moving to put everybody on, on death ground. Death ground. And, and getting them off hopium, getting them off uh, all these these hopeful things, because you know once once you realize the system is is not reformable, it has to have perpetual growth and things like that. It's um, it's it, the, the the big lie. We're all living a lie, and you just got to get you know whittled down through the lies. And your ego is really a big lie. So it's you know, in some ways it's just so you just got to get to the truth, get through everybody's lies personal collective religious all these lies need to be stripped away when you have a soldier that's not lying to themselves then you've got a fighter uh, but until then you've just got a waste of time on your hands <laughs> and so yeah so so that's the the major goal that's that you know movements should should be trying to get to in as fast as possible well that, yeah. that's probably why the the, the the people who who deny um, climate emergency uh, are are working towards uh, <clears throat> not getting an army of people who are powerful in front of them and sowing the seeds of hope and greenwashing because otherwise if they let the despair grow as it should they would find themselves in front of an impossible situation to control. Yeah, they, I mean it's not all malicious, but they're definitely doing panic management. And the the easiest thing for panic, man, panic management is to sell this hopeful narrative. So the, the hopeful narrative is the poison of the resistance. So, yeah, so, yeah, just, yeah, just talking about the other thing, about, I just suddenly remembered another thing now. Talking, go, let's go back to symmetry breaking with a kind of a false flag operation, just like Braveheart and stuff. Um, it was also done in Algeria. It's in many, many places. Once, once I've told it to you, you can go back and look at some of these, these things and see them. But so mentioned a few times and even posted up on a YouTube 
a film called The Battle for Algiers. Now, The Battle for Algiers is a movie that was a standard training uh, tra um, training material for left-wing revolutionaries from like Bada Minoff to everybody, everybody who's anybody on in the left uh, used about that movie. And also the movie was very highly acclaimed from a cinem cinematic point of view. So it's often taught in movie school and stuff because it was very well directed. So, okay, so what happens in the Battle of Algiers is interesting too. And this is also this, this idea that I was saying where you put forward a bluff and a faint. Now, what happens in that movie is historically accurate. And I can't remember, it's the FNLA, not the FNLA, the, my, basically the, the, the rebels against the French. The FLN. FLN? FLN, yeah. FLN, yeah. So, so the so the FLN, um, they they um, you know went through this just all the stages that you do a rebellion. You know, they get stop all the people smoking the hopium. They get them all the drugs, start training them. Get them. They find a big old rebellion. The French crush them because they just have so so much might. When the FLN was crushed. They eventually they get the last holdout of the last FLN leader, all the, the French paratroopers. They 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 find them in their little rat hole. They take them out. Rebellion crushed. Do 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 do. What immediately happens is a couple of weeks later, the people sweep the streets and France is out. It's like whoa. <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, what they teach left-wing revolutionaries is, is that what happened in Algeria was that when somebody else is fighting for you, when the, while the FLN was fighting for the for the people, they didn't they let them do the fighting. They let they were freeloading on them. So imagine imagine what happens. Imagine you're just some fruit seller or something in in Algiers. They're the, the French gendarmes and things. They're making your life shitty as hell. But how you get over it is you have this coping mechanism. The coping mechanism is every time a gendarme kicks over your fruit stand or, you know, fills up your wife or daughter or something like that. And you, what you do is you go like, you know, if, wait till the FLN gets you. you got to find out, Jacques. We're going to get you. In the <laughs> and so then they, they have this you know, uh, this release valve. So they, while the FLN is there, they've got their little, you know, their little mascot that's fighting for them. And so uh, they don't need to rebel. It's only when they realize that the FLN is gone and they really are screwed. And then they're on dead ground. They're like, okay, well, now France is going to be, <laughs> we, we're in Algerian colony forever now, or we do something. And that when they realized that they were really screwed, well, then they came out on the streets and then they, they swept the French out in seconds. So again, it's Wu Wei. You see, you see what the FLN only you know they weren't that smart, but if they were if they were smarter, they would set that situation up. They would they would do um, a massive insurrection that failed. You know, and then you know, the sooner it failed, the sooner the people would rise up. So it's, it's think of it in terms of climate change. It's more important to collapse for the green side to collapse. So it's more important for environmentalists to collapse. See, while this, you know, Earth three three fifty and stuff like that, and Greenpeace and that, everybody chucks a little money at them, and it's like fuck all happens. If all those organizations say like, uh, we all, we all baked. It's like nothing's. It's you know we can wrap it up now. Um, climate, uh, the tipping points are over. The elephants are gone. Polar bears are gone. It's like guys, it's like we tried our best, but we're going home now. 
I mean, immediately what would happen is all these, you know, snowflakes that are now thinking in terms of climate changes. Maybe I won't have vanilla in my latte or I might not have avocado toast anymore. This could get really bad. I might have to shop at Walmart. Suddenly they'd be like, no, wait, what? You mean, you mean, wait, run this by me. Ecology has gone. We're fucked. I mean, we're going to die. I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we told you, you didn't listen. Now you're going to die. And then they'd be like, no, no, that's wrong. They, oh, no, there must be something you can do. <laughs> well, then they would spark. But they're not going to spark while people are, you know, while they have visual images of, you know, uh, people going like in XR, going out into the streets. And it's like, oh, I'll upvote that. Oh, look, look, a million upvotes for Greta. It's like, while you're doing a million upvotes for Greta, you're doing what that fruit store guy is doing. He's saying like, oh, you're not going to be Greta. Greta's my alter ego, and she's she's going to win. It's like, no, you're sitting there on a computer burning fucking fossil fuels while you do upvotes. Nothing is happening. While Greta sits in front of the United Nations going, no, no, there's hot air going up. There's nothing going on, and they know it. But, the you know, our side is too stupid to, <laughs> to see it. They too, and, and the reason they're too stupid is, is ego. Basically, as long as they're getting ego reflection, they're getting this narcissism, they're getting narcissistic supply from Greta alter ego. But uh, you know, if if you know, if you were if you were really really serious about about this, you, you'd make Greta suffer some kind of accident that would put her out of the game. So so in other words, if if the guys were a little you know harsher players, so in, in other words, things were a little more. African or <laughs> a little bit more third worldy. How how you would how you'd play this would you'd do a false flag thing that basically someone, you know, some icon like that happened to basically, you know, wind up with an accident. The the outrage of that, of, of losing the alter ego and that 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 person out there would be so so much more effective. You know, be like people would consider it war. But until it happens, uh, you know, all these figures like Greta are being counterproductive. They, they're keeping symmetrical. Yeah. They're keeping symmetrical. Does everybody understand that, or am I going to get death threats? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I, I understand. I think what you're saying basically is like the whole rhetoric with uh, Greta. It's like simulating revolution and people are living vicariously through her words and there's like no deeds at all to correct the course or stop the system from destroying the rest of the ecology yeah and when when they do an accounting you see this is what's so dangerous about geoengineering and green tech and these things is is when they do the accounting and realize that they empty strategies it's going to be far far too late so the danger of things like carbon taxes and stuff is anywhere anybody with a brain in their head knows that a carbon market is going to be faked. They're going to somewhere down the road and by 2030, they're going to be like, well, you know, after all this thing, oh, we're making progress and look, we have carbon markets and we have people committing to, you know, net zero by 2050. And, and so like, and then when you do the accounting, they say, guys, it's not working. The CO2 has actually gone up with all these wonderful things, and it's gone up. And it's like, well, that's going to be 10 years down the road, man. You're not going to be able to cycle that back, and you've still got another 10 years of lag in the system in, in terms of CO2. But we're fucked already. The, the tipping points have gone. They're gone. Well, I, I think also that people are being groomed through this experience of COVID at the moment in the same, to bring them into the, the same direction. If you see what I mean, uh, I, I might not explain that very well, but, you know, it's the false hopes, the, the continuous reference to vaccines, to business, to back to business as usual, to We'll be back to before. It's the same, the same kind of psychological uh, mechanism that's operating there too. Um, it's it's just so that the climate situation is is presented a bit in the same way with the greenwashing. It's the same thing, and 
I, I, I see the same um, the same mechanism working in the two in the two events, the two things. It's it's addictive behavior. So the the model for it is is um, somebody that has uh, an addiction. So if you you know, if you, like an alcoholic, they'll they'll find every which way to delay and every which way. The uh, the only thing, the most effective thing you can do is give them a monstrous fright. So as a as a doctor or something for an alcoholic patient is if they come in with like you know sore stomach or something, you say like you've got a, you've got a week to live. Your liver's shot. Look at this X-ray and just hold up a false one. That person's got a hell of a lot more chance than somebody who say, "Well, let's work through this." <laughs> so you you have to put somebody on death ground, right? Especially with an addiction. Right? Yeah, but it, yeah, that that's yeah, that's pretty good for for this this amount. But, but there are lots of other ways of looking at it, and the. In terms of, there's another way of looking at it, and that is in terms of the economics of their behavior. So the the cost benefit analysis in terms of strategy on on rebel side, and in terms of behavior in the public, and you look at it in terms of cost benefit, and that that's a big lack, uh, particularly on the left, is they don't have an economic brain cell in their head. And it's it's unfortunate because, as I said, the psychopaths, you're, the, it's like a duel. The, the guys you're dueling against, they get to choose the weapons. So it's in, in more enlightened times when we fought duels, the, you know, you can, you, can, um, you can demand a duel, but the other guy gets to choose the weapons. That's, that's the rule. And so it's like we demand change, and then it's like, okay, well, it's a battle to the death now. So it's like the other side gets to choose the weapons. And, and so uh, their weapon is cost-benefit analysis. So you have to engage on that turn. So, okay, let's go back to the Indian dam. The, 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 how many villages? 6,000 villages? The, the yeah, guys have, for, for, you know, that's the, a good they go, estimate, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the guys have fertilizer and diesel. All farmers have fertilizer and diesel, and that's why governments don't normally mess with them. <laughs> but those guys are well in their favor to make it uneconomical to put that dam up. You see, look look in terms of any any project like, like that dam is look at all the players involved, all the surveyors, all the workers on that dam, all the engineers. They're all destroying these villages uh, for a measly salary per month. So it's easy in terms of risk and reward to turn that around for them. And all you say is like, drive a truck, dump cement on this dam, chances you get a bullet in the head is about one in a hundred. It's like, that money is suddenly way, way too expensive. Ain't nobody driving a truck down there. So then, you know, they have to make it more economical. What what will happen is the construction, the guys doing the construction, all the dirty politicians that got backhanders and champagne trips for you know selling out and getting this dam, is all of those guys will then do what all the psychopath weasels do, and that would be they'll lean on the security forces to make it more economical for them. Cheap, cheap, uh, cheap economics is get get the get the soldiers and the police in to be your bully boys. So, but the same applies to the soldiers and police. You, you can easily make a situation where they, they have to halt construction on the dam. As soon as you do that, the clock's ticking on them. So, so, with, so basically think it through. How many people died in that situation? If the guys were really determined and just basically just went at night and popped caps in the engineers on the wall, it's just like three people would die and that would be the end of that construction. And better still is like, if if the if the psychopaths knew that you try to put up a dam, well, don't do it in this place because those guys. I mean, if you did that in like Afghanistan with with those guys, it's like they don't want you to put up a dam. There. You're not putting up a dam there. <laughs> so you know, if everybody knows that, that's why they don't go and do those projects. 
they did actually do one in Afghanistan, but they got it done with, and, and now the guys know, basically that dam they did in Afghanistan, it was all salt leaching. It basically caused the poppy crisis and all of this stuff. Now all the Taliban and those guys, they're like, you're not putting up another dam. <laughs> you're not going to drop a single truck where there's concrete. Why? Because you'd have to pay the guy danger money that's 10 grand. So you've got to think in terms of cost benefit analysis in terms of and all the way down to something like XR's, XR's thing in like Trafalgar Square. Spent a million pounds. Most of it went on vegan meals to support these guys. You might as well have got cardboard, you know, cardboard cutouts. If the only reason why you in the in down there in uh, Trafalgar Square is for a vegan meal, you should you shouldn't be there. You, you're a waste of time. And so so they spend a million pounds on a couple of days of protest, and you say like, Jesus wept. If that was the ANC in South Africa. Oh, who were nonviolent by a win for nonviolence, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, from Erica Chenoweth, according to her story. But if that million pounds would have um, would have financed the war in South Africa for, for a decade, <laughs> and it was effective, and they won. Why? Because they did. All everything was cost benefit. I mean, but you have to do that cost-benefit analysis. All these people are being profligate and egotistical, doing things like, say, uh, hunger strikes. Is is he saying like, okay, put a price on that rebel's head and say, you are a committed rebel to the extent that you will actually harm yourself and give you give yourself bodily harm. You'll take a risk like that. You're fucking valuable. So you're taking such a valuable rebel, sticking them on a street, and and maybe give them irreparable liver damage or something. It's like, this is fucked up, guys. That rebel is too valuable to have them making a pointless symbolic gesture on the street. Take that rebel and go and do some, you know what I mean? Yeah, that commitment can be translated into very, very effective action. What if you think of it in terms of cost benefit? If somebody is is so committed to the cause that they actually will do themselves self, self harm, is like say, don't do yourself self harm. Spread it outwards. Spread it outwards. Do do it to the other side, and you can find actions that are incredibly expensive for the other side, and yeah, so cost pennies for the for the revolution. There is a blockage in, in movements like XR that are dominated by a left-wing way of thinking about uh, about thinking cost-benefit, about calculating it. There's a there's a blockage. There's definitely when you start to go into that sort of discussion, you kind of you pushed away. You know, we don't go into this. This is not. You know, it's just uh, I don't know how to get through to. to uh, no, no, I know exactly how to get through. It's it's actually quite easy. So. All of these things people give a lot of credence to because we live in a liberal democracy and we are very, very privileged. And so we overvalue these things and we overvalue the obstacles. And we think, you know, ideas are sacrosanct and people's beliefs are entrenched. It's all horseshit. Basically, those things disappear like that. I, so I'll give an example. It's like, I was, okay, I was just talking to somebody here very left wing you know the usual thing uh ivory tower academic you know um you know the, the kind of horseshit like racism was invented by the patriarchy in the 18th century you know that kind of bullshit um you know anyway so that's that's the that's the kind of you know you get the picture so so the conversation went from you know which is worse, fascism or communism? And so I, uh, I had a little moment there because I realized, um, you know, how fucked up uh, privileged people are in terms of just this subject about how entrenched things, how much change you can induce in people and stuff like that. Um, so here's how the conversation went. This is a, 
so I said, no, I, communists scare the bejesus out of me because, you know, I'd much rather live under fascism because the, the way I describe it is like, you know, fascists suit you in the face for who you are, but communists stab you in the back for what you think. And, you know, she was saying like, well, I, I, you can always change what you think and stuff and say, no, you might be stabbed in the back for thinking something which you didn't know was wrong. So you don't want communists because you don't want to live in a regime where they get inside your head all the time. That's that's like living in the worst abuse uh, you can imagine. I mean, it's it's colored by my personal thing. But anyway, the crux of it was I said, you know, if fascists let, let you alone, if you're not if you're not opposing them and you're not the wrong creed or something like that, uh, you know, they will kind of let you alone. So that's better, from, especially if you a minority is, uh, you know. Um, but the, um, here, here's the thing. If, if you play by the rules with fascists, you'll generally do okay as a, a minority. I mean, don't take it too far if you're Jewish and <laughs> they like a little bit, you know, blood and soil. You might get that calculation wrong. But, the, but in general, it's better that the, you know, you don't fuck, they don't fuck with your head. So okay, so so that was the premise. But the mistake I made was saying, well, I've I've lived under fascism in South Africa, so I know what I'm talking about. And what she said was, oh yeah, but you benefited from the fascism. <laughs> and I just burst out laughing because I realized in an instant that that her viewpoint was so childish and trivial and it's representative of most people in America or say the UK is like the struggle in South Africa was it was just it was nasty white people being racist to black people and it was all sorted out by Mandela and and it's like that is so fucking wrong you can't even begin but but here, here I, I tried to think of a way that I could explain to her how complicated it was, and I kind of so gave gave it some thought, and, I, and I, I realized there were a number of things where you could just say to her that would really show show her, you know, how how wrong she is in so many levels. And so one of them is uh, most of the people fighting in Angola on the on the border war were black. Okay. The vast majority of the people fighting on the pool were black. The, there were a few corporals who were white, and there were a few officers, and they didn't want to be there. So, so go and fix fit that into your cosmology of what was going. On. So, why did it, why were black people fighting for apartheid? It's like it's way more complicated, way more complicated than than you ever imagine. So, but the, these simple narratives. Uh, you know, are, are part of privilege. See, see uh, people that have really been in the shit know that it's kind of a big pool of entropy. And what we're going to into is a big pool of entropy. We're not going into an ideological war. Ideological wars are very, very complex. So, so the whole thing that was going on in South Africa was extremely complex. The major theme of it was it was a proxy war between communism and capitalism. So the, uh, the so the secret to why the black guys were fighting on the white side is they were Christians, and basically the, the uh, communists were a much bigger enemy than than white guys, <laughs> white capitalists, who who promoted apartheid. So you, you, all of these things come come into into play. But what what I'm trying to say is now to what Sophie was saying about about how do you change all of this? It's it's very trivial okay so so here's another thing that i would say to um uh, to this girl i was talking to is is like something which i think she would find kind of amazing is that all white males had to go into the south african army to fight you see 50 percent of them didn't believe in apartheid all the guys i was with didn't and me I, we didn't believe in apartheid i wasn't going to fight a minute for apartheid now you think like, well, why did you? <laughs> it's like because they'll give you six six years in detention barracks, and detention barracks is like a six years of basically you won't survive. It's it's grueling, grueling, grueling. It's it's like hard, six years of hard labor. It's, you're not going to do that. 
<laughs> you're going to go and when your fucking papers arrive and they say you must turn up at this this base at this time and stuff, you're going to turn up there. You're not going to say, I thought I'm a vegan or like I don't agree or I'm, I'm into Gandhi. Or they don't give a shit. You turn up there and you will. And so you say, but how do they get all these people to fight? Well, armies, have, when you leave your ideology behind. When the shit hits the fan and you're in an, in an army, it doesn't matter what you believe. That's what liberals and we've been too soft. We haven't been in wars and stuff for too long. We've had too much peace. People's brains go to rock when it comes to war and peace. But if you have too, an extended time of peace, people f forget what war is all about. They get delusion all about. So, so, so here's the thing. We're very likely, I'm only telling you this because I've, what I foresee is this kind of thing. We are going to war. You can see us inexorably drifting towards, creeping towards war. They, it's not clear what kind of war, you know, third world war, hot war, but it, it's likely to be, the Cold War never finished. The Cold War's still going on and it's likely to be proxy wars and all that, and you might be in one. Britain is not, uh, you know, is a potential candidate for a country like South Africa that could be in a proxy war situation especially in the Navy and so, so what I'm saying is you might as a Briton or American be called up in a draft, right? So, and I'm telling you, you're not going to escape to Canada. Those days are over. You're going to turn up and you're going to serve. It doesn't matter what you believe. So it's like, you know, 80% of the country in South Africa was against apartheid. They were black. They were virulently deadly opposed to apartheid. 20% can easily hold on to the country with a gun. That's just the reality of it. <laughs> if, you, if you don't have the guns and you don't have the material, you're fucked. So, so I'm just painting this to show you that it's, it's not like you think. So let's go to what Sophie was saying. Is It doesn't matter what, what these people think in terms of left wing and right wing and they're so full of shit and they don't do cost benefit accounting and say like, it's, it's, it's that shallow. It's just a thin veneer. When the shit hits the fan, all that shit is gone. It's gone, gone like that. It's gone, it disappears. So the, the main thing is, is not to concentrate on that shit. And try, you, you're never going to reason anybody out of these things. You're never going to change anybody's mind. But you change their circumstance. Just stick them in the army in basic training. So, like, they can't even remember they were vegan. So the... Well, you see, we don't understand because we're so privileged how thin that little layer is. You know, that's my ego. <laughs> the, your ego is easy to get rid of. And so you can do it in a cult. And that's why I keep on harping about doing a cult and an arg. Is people will lose their ego just playing at losing their ego. That's how thin it is. So, so for, for example, look at the Stanley Milgram experiment, right? You can just put, you know, these privileged, white, nice, liberal people in an experiment with a few guys with a white coat. It's like, gone. All that veneer of civilization is gone. They're really shocking people <laughs> left and right. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, the Yale experiment, the prisoner experiment and stuff. You just put just put someone in a, in a uniform. You know, you get somebody who's... You know, one day they're sprouting liberal shit and social justice and something. Stick them in a uniform and say, you know, make these guys work. They'll be hitting them across the back with a stick. So if those things are very, very thin once you change the dynamic. You know, just, I mean, just think about it. It's like, it doesn't matter who you are. You go, you go to San Quentin prison. Three minutes your ideology is gone. Now, now you're trying not to get a shiv in your ribs. <laughs> it's like, oh, welcome to reality. So you can set up the, the behavior changes the person. So, so you can set up the circumstance. And a cult does that. The cult really is. So uh, basic training in the military, all militaries, is about three months. Why? What they're doing in that three months is they're not training you to be a soldier. All they're doing is breaking down your ego. Um, basically, it's, you know, freeze, unfreeze, freeze again. So it's, a, it's the same thing as in the cult. A military is a cult. So, so 
if you if you just give me all the people you like 24 hours a day in three months i'll have a new person in front of me and it's it's very easy there's every army does it I've, I've told you a few of the things they put people in a double bind right so they can't be either author or mother there's no, there's no clear path to uh correct action right or acceptable action is everything you do is is wrong so then you know right to the point where you you have a drill sergeant who stands next to you on your left side and a drill sergeant that stands next to you on your right side and they say and the one side says get down and give me 50. and the other one says i never said get down get up what are you doing getting down and then the other says what are you doing getting up and you go, and they just go left and right left and right until oh i i literally had that happen to me in boot camp fucking literally <laughs> yeah they, every single so you've done military training so you know what i'm talking about but oh yeah you, yeah i went through so, the air force boot camp in the u.s oh yeah they do that oh and it's yeah, worse it, too. it's done in every single fucking military in in the thing so i'll tell you another thing that they do to, to break down your ego it's very very easy so the, the first uh tell me if the divine beast tell me if they did this but i, I was in the air force too and this is where I, it's it, everywhere you can go to argentina you can go afghanistan you'll find the same technique and the um so what they do is they they would give you a timed run and for some reason everything in the south african army was tractor tires and telephone poles you always had carried tractors and telephones. <laughs> it was everything you instructed us. And so the reason for it is quite interesting. And the reason is two people are needed to carry a tractor tire or telephone pole. You can't do it on your own. That's the secret number one. <laughs> okay. So what they do is they give you this course and it's a 1.4 kilometers of as a standard thing. And you, you had to no 2.4. You had to do a 2.4 in under 10 minutes with all these kit on and stuff. And then, then, you know, what happens on the very first day is all these guys come down with their egos. And then some guys are big and fat and they're really scared because they can't run more than five yards and they're thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then there's some guys who are like really fit and they buff and they can run the four minute mile and they think, yeah, I'm going to kill this. Yeah, I'm into this. And you, so you got the full range, right? And then they, you know, everybody takes off from the, you know, the big, you know, the guys with the big hoonies, they all like, you know, running, uh, coming in five minutes and they go, like, done it, uh, not even tired. And the other guys go, ah, 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 and they come all the way around. And then basically, and they go like, okay, you didn't make it. And the guys go, wait, wait, no, I, I made it. I, I was in under five minutes. And they said, yeah, but that guy took 15 minutes. And they go, but, but, He's a big fat ass. I mean, like, I can't do say, so, uh, uh everybody's got to make it in 10 minutes. And then they go like, they're like, fuck. And they line everybody up and then you run again. They do it all over and they say, mm -mm, didn't make it. Fat guy's now taking 20 minutes. And the guys go nuts, especially the guys with the big ego and the stuff. And they just make you run and run until you think, Eventually, even the thickest guy gets it. He said, like, the only way we're going to get out of this hell and stop running round and round on this 2.4 is if we all make it over in 10 minutes. And so then the strong guys, they have to pick up the fat guy and run with him. And then, bang, that's the moment. When, when the guys do that, they get it. I mean, that's how long it takes. It's a, a day, right? One day, and the guys are already a team because the it's kind of brutal because they know what's going to happen, um, and it's deliberate too. They know when you go back to the barracks, that fat guy's going to get the shit kicked out of them. So they it's it's not all sweetness and light. <laughs> the instructors know that's what's going to happen, but that's also part of it. Is because if you've got a big fat guy who's you know basically been you know molly coddled all his life, is like he's uh he's got a problem that you know in the west they would say oh well it's you know obesity and it's it's genetic and you can't do anything about it. it's horseshit <laughs> you you get all the guys taking you back in the barracks and beat the hell out of you because you couldn't make that 
<laughs> you'll get thin real fast. <laughs> so like, oh, it wasn't so genetic after all. So in other words, what I'm saying is we're full of shit in the Western world. And that shit is so paper thin. But you see, then when all these guys uh, get, well, what, what they've done is they've lost all their ego. They're united as, as a force. And they have a collective ego. And then the bonds get very strong. So, so in the, in the end, you will see the the fat guy get thin, and the big muscular guy go, "Oh, you're my best buddy, and I'm sorry I beat you up in basic training." They bond, and that's how it's done. So the question is not how do we reason with these guys and change their minds. It's like just just hand them over. If you give me control of their time, I'll give you their con control of the outcome. And so that's why it's been like that since the, since armies were invented round about agriculture. One of the things that amazed me was, I, don't, I have actually mentioned this before, but I'm sure you've forgotten this. In 1174, the whole world went to pieces. Right, All the major civilizations disappeared. The Mesopotamians, the Minoans, everybody, uh, the Hittites, all these guys, they all disappeared. Right, There were various theories for why, but only one empire survived, and that was the Egyptian one. And very close, in fact, they were almost overrun. They were overrun by these guys called the Sea Peoples. They think the Sea Peoples were now just basically early anarchists. They were just basically a rabble <laughs> that uh, that basically took down all these empires. So pirates, pirates, pirates. <laughs> pirates, yeah, yeah. But they know that they were from about five nations. They were they can see from the from from the. It's really interesting because they they have these triptychs and things from. Uh, Egypt, um, these murals with, and, and from the murals, they can say, Oh, that guy's somatic. That guy's got a, he, some of them have um, um, Peleus ha hats, you know. You know, Peleus from French Revolution. So basically, that's how the Peleus hat goes all the way back to Anatolia. They're actually from so the, the, Frisian, the Frisian hat, is it? I mean, yeah. the Frisian hat, yeah, the Peleus, yeah. It's called the Pillars, but it's uh, the Frisian hat goes goes all the way back to Sibylle. It's actually her Corribantes, the the unit guys we were talking about. That's the hat. So they can oh. see those guys right there in the thing. And so all the way to the rebels in the French Revolution, it's like these are the same guys. These are the sea people. They haven't gone away. And so, so, But here's the interesting thing that, that really blows me away. Is Ramses almost got his ass kicked by, by the sea people. They, they only narrowly managed to defeat them. So he captured like 3,000 of them. And, and, and so you say like, well, what did he do with them? Did he, did he slaughter them? Did he keep them in prison for the rest of their life or whatever? Is it like, you know, any clue? He just drafted them into nope. the Egyptian army. <laughs> that's, that's oh. Amazing. You say, oh, but but hang on, these guys were were enemy soldiers. It's like that would be disaster. You put them in your own army. That's like fifth columnists. And say, no, that's not how the armies work. <laughs> the minute you well, get into was... an army, it's like you leave your ideology and identity behind. So the, yeah, the it... Egyptian army was like they just gave you Egyptian army training. You came out of that a proud Egyptian soldier. And you say, hey, you meet your buddies, you'll be slashing their heads off, and they'll be like, hey. Aren't you Frank, the old, uh, you know, guy with, guy with a Frisian hat who was one of the sea people? Yeah, that was a month ago. <laughs> I'm an Egyptian now. <laughs> it's like, that's all it takes. So you can't put too much store on all this ego stuff. It's really paper. <laughs> it's, what's important, though, is who controls people's time. So, so at the moment, plantation owners have their time. People are spending eight hours a day in in the enemy camp. So, yeah, if you spend eight, eight hours a day working in a cubicle or a factory as a debt slave or driving a truck, your mind is being controlled by the wrong army. So the more difficult problem is how to get people out of that situation into a situation where you have control of their time. <laughs> Just... Hand them over to me. I'll, I will churn out as many dedicated rebels as you want. Just yeah, and it, and it's even more than the the eight hour work shift because they go home and switch on the tube, and the capitalists are still having their time. So it's like 
Um, yeah. You gotta, if, yeah, you kind of have to break away from that. And uh, when you get home, don't interface with the, you know, the market system and the media and all that and kind of do your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. You can actually ca capture their, their minds in, in situ. So if, so particularly with a cult, um, the real tipping point is is when you get them to to break loyalty with the system. So the bigger problem that XR has today is that everybody's loyal to the system. The mere fact, you see, it's completely counterproductive to take people down and do marches and things like that. It's, it's why it's counterproductive is is you reinforcing the system you actually doing very bad psychology because while people are marching and protesting to government, you are actually subtly acknowledging the government's authority. So you, you are in essence saying, I'm a petitioner of the government. In other words, accepting that I'm an underling, I'm more childlike, I'm more infantile. You're the boss and you're in control. And yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's um, engaging in the the symbolic system that they have full control over. Yeah, yeah, it's giving it legitimacy when you're playing their their game. Yeah, but, it'd be but, it, it'd probably scare the shit out of them if XR just went dark. <laughs> yeah, no, I've I've often said that is is what what they should do if they really wanted to scare the shit out of the system and really have good effect is when Pretty Patel and stuff. Actually, it's not too late to provoke it. So, so it's not too late for some hardcore, let's say, uh, rebels to go and do a few actions and slap a big XR symbol on it uh, and force the rest of the people into radicalization. So they will go, meh, 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 that wasn't us. And you say like, mm -mm. you see what the, what the guys should do, the, the leadership in XR should actually, uh, try and provoke a situation where the government declares them terrorists, at, at which point they should really embrace it and say, okay, you want us to be terrorists? Right, you've got it. We weren't gonna be terrorists before. We weren't going we were absolutely committed to nonviolence, but you fucked it up. You broke the contract. You want us to be terrorists? Now we're fucking terrorists and it's you that did it, bang. And then they go underground. That, that is, that would send shockwaves through, through the system but it's you know it's kind of an advanced stage to get to because everybody still has loyalty to the system but yeah, that's the uh, core thing if you can do if you can get people to break loyalty to the system yeah especially with that stuff that happened back in january you know with the with the yeah um yeah if xr uh, went underground started doing stuff like that that probably because you could see all the all the people in the government were shitting their pants <laughs> it's it's the you gonna okay you're going to have to go for the kryptonite you know what i'm talking about with the kryptonite is you, you there is no way to avoid it the longer yep. you refrain from the kryptonite the more damage the more violence you're causing now it's counterintuitive because you think well if we don't resort to violence then basically the other side will be nice no <laughs> basically you the, the delay just think in terms of the population, if, if we're heading for a brick wall in terms of population and habitat and stuff, the sooner, it, it, the sooner we accelerate the end of this system and the global industrial system, the, the more lives you're saving, the more pain you're avoiding, the more chance the survivors have of squeezing through. So being nice in a desperate situation is just like Chamberlain being an appeaser in terms of Hitler. You're just costing out. Look, look at Chamberlain. Chamberlain's a criminal. Chamberlain's a fuck. If I, if I, I would like to kick Chamberlain in the fucking balls. I'd like to exhume him and like just fucking pour vitriol on his piss on his fucking skull. And the reason is because he, because he was weak. He caused so much damage. In in essence, I would go this far. If you're Jewish, don't moan about you know, the Holocaust to Hitler. Chamberlain, Chamberlain caused the Holocaust. So why? Because when Hitler was just flexing his muscles, they went into the Sudetenland, which they were not allowed to do because of the, the Treaty of Versailles. 
So Hitler was challenging them and seeing how determined France and Britain were. were. And it turned out they were fucking measly, weak, yellow-bellied cowards. So when the German forces went into the Sudetenland and, and broke the Treaty of Versailles, basically uh, they, that was them tearing up the Treaty of Versailles. The French could have just moved in there and swept them out of there. Just fucking Hitler would have been out of office in a minute. They would have been trembling. For, basically, that you would have avoided World War II. All they had to do was march into the Sudetenland in response. You know that the guys, Hitler's generals, they were crapping themselves. They, when they went over the bridges into the Sudetenland, they, they were gibbering wrecks. They thought Hitler had lost his mind. They said, "This is we are going to be destroyed. We're like a tenth of the size of France. We, 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 we cannot go into the Ruhr. These, they will crush us. When the, when the armies marched across the bridges, the generals, their, their accounts of the generals literally shivering. They were so nervous. That was the time to be strong. And what happened? Oh, peace in our time, and we can avoid violence. And say, like, look what you did. You killed 8 million people, you fucking shits. That's what pacifism does. You've got to take, be decisive at the right time and ruthless at the right time for benefit. And so, so yeah, you don't want to be a psychopath, but it's a kind of psychopathy to be an extreme pacifist. Hope that all makes yeah. sense because it's not yeah. easy for people to grasp. That also reminds me, I think uh, Emma Goldman said it. She says something like ignorance is violence. Yep. Pacifism is violence. Extreme pacifism is is a is a form of, of violence. And it's violence to the self and, and violence to the planet. But yeah, and it's I mean, violence against our nature. But we, 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 you see, what we have to accept is we, to get back to Eden and to get back to our real nature, we, we're in the twilight zone. So, so we're in the situation that is a dystopia beyond belief. So we need to get back, but you can't. Survival, survival. Yeah. Survival is what's at stake. So you can't say, but I'm a nice primate. All I want to be is back in Eden. And you say, yeah, but you've got to fight your way back into Eden now because of where we got to. You can't get yeah. yourself out of this forest. Yeah, you can't because, um, you know, the those in power in the system, you know, wage war on us to steal Eden and then sell it back to us in the form of commodities. And so it's going to be, you know, violence to destroy the system and get back to whatever's left to those that can make it. Yeah. But you see that what the race is, is in, in convincing people that things are that desperate. So it's just, a you know, when people realize, you know, things are that desperate, then, then they will, will step up to it. So it's when people realize how bad Hitler is, then they're all ready to go to war. But by then it's, it's too late. It's, uh, you know, if, uh, if Hitler's the climate crisis, we're baked. If you left it as long as that until till you're absolutely certain that this is necessary that we actually have to take these drugs we're in a situation where you can't wait that long and i don't give us much hope because i don't i think we're just too fucking nice the the psychopaths are too too um too rigid and psychopathic and we're just too damn nice and that 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 is the single biggest problem facing us today. Yep, yep. But but yeah. So but I mean, in terms of strategy, uh, you you at this point, it would be a good idea to draw out the psychopathy. So basically, expose the psychopathy. It's very see, it's very easy to get them to show their true colors. I mean, it's in terms of just uh, human psychology. I mean, I, I I make a I personally I made a career out of doing it with gurus and stuff, all these fake gurus and stuff. And what what you do is you just peck away until you find the ego. When you find the ego, they get angry. Well, as soon as they get angry, all their followers know that they're frauds. 
So it, it applies to a guru, a leader, it applies to a government. So all, all the nice little liberals and stuff are all prepared to, you know, overlook the psychopaths bad side and say, well, they're redeemable and we Christians and we can forgive them and perhaps they'll spawn to love and they can change and, and all that stuff evaporates as soon as you can uh, make the psychopaths reveal their anger. It's, it's quite easy to do. You just, you just have to be able to provoke it. Now, okay. Yeah, so there's, buttons, there's buttons to press. There's buttons to press that are quite simple. If you, yeah. if you go down to psychology, they, 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 they're really in the archetypes that you talked about with you. They're, they're, we can talk about that maybe another time because it's getting a bit late. Yeah, maybe yeah, it's well, um, off, but one of the things you can do and i do this too sometimes if i'm talking to someone and you know i see that there's a part of them that you know i can see the system is wrong i'll play devil's advocate immediately and i'll find it <laughs> mm. it's a great skill but anyway just before we go then they just mention our ireland and the what they were very good at in ireland is make a, you know basically britain was all rather cool until basically they stood up uh, and used kryptonite on the English, and then suddenly, well, the English started shooting civilians and stuff, and it was like, oh, not so nice, were you? <laughs> now we know what this is all about. It's like, so, so in, in almost one day, in 1916, um, the, the Irish rebels turned the entire population against Britain. But you've got to use kryptonite. The other thing I'd mention is, one don't underestimate the power of kryptonite kryptonite the reason why they ritualize all the stuff about you know pacifism and stuff is is that's the one thing they really scared of is their own methods so so the we must go back to this again and again but talking about ireland is is there's this thing which i i posted this video and i don't know how to highlight it enough but you can't highlight it enough is it, it was about the, the English experience in Northern Ireland. It was just a, a brief clip from the BBC. And these guys were you're going and having a look at one, an English base near, near County Armagh. And it, anyway, you have the English reporter and he's going in. The, essentially, the, the British are in this base. They have to fly in and out in helicopter, incredibly expensive in, ter in terms of cost benefit. Running a helicopter is about three thousand dollars an hour, like one of those pumas and stuff. Easily three thousand dollars an hour. So, so ferrying men and material and stuff in and out of a of a army camp like that is fucking break the back of the British bank, and it it, it was. So, but you know, so here you see the barbed wire and all this thing and all the special forces and the guys and these in this thing and you know. Somewhere in your mind, you're building up the, the idea that this is a besieged army. The British army is besieged in Northern Ireland, really, hanging on by their fingertips. And, <laughs> and then the, the, the killer moment in the movie, in the documentary, is they're flying in this helicopter. There's, you know, officers, you know, doing the PR stuff. And the guy says, like, they fly over these like tiny little village with about 12 houses. And he says, ah, that's the rebel stronghold over there. I could have shut my pants because the guy, the BBC says, oh, okay, so, so how many rebels are there? And the guy said, uh, we think 12, maybe as much as 20. <laughs> I just about fell on the floor laughing. <laughs> just think about it. They're 12. Fuckers that are holding the U.S. government—I mean, the the British government—to ransom. They're draining the treasury out, bleeding. This is twelve guys that spend most of their lives in the pub. <laughs> that's what it takes. If you use kryptonite, that's what it takes. You can defeat the British army. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you, you nickel, oh, you nickel. Of it. Yeah, you, you nickel and dime them to death. <laughs> Yeah, well, you managed to eliminate uh, Mount Batman, Lord Mount Batman. <laughs> and yeah, but don't, don't say that. To me. <laughs> no, but what I mean is, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of kryptonite going around at the moment, actually, in the north, you know, again yeah. now. 
Mm -hmm. Let's go. Well, well, you see, this is all good. You see, but but the 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 thing that that would be nice is if uh, if those guys were were taken out of the sectarian mindset and and elevated in terms of like uh, anarchist mm -hmm. thinking that this is a systemic problem. It's wrong to go and to make it sectarian and particularly yeah. religious when the whole thing is really systemic and, and yeah. goes back to the systemic thing. So it, I think the IRA did quite a good job in that and trying to say that this is a big war against agriculture and civilization and the, the, the system. Yeah, they used to, but now it's being, it's completely changed now. Yeah, but we've got to get back and educate them. <laughs> they're liberal. I know, but they're, 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 they're on the liberal agenda now, most of them. Whether Sinn Féin or the unionists, uh, they're, they've completely uh, renounced uh, James Connolly's ideas and everything. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a liberal sectarian agenda. Oh, fuck it. Fuck yeah. it. Fuck it. Yeah, it's um, like, um, oh, go ahead. Oh no! Go you go ahead and then oh, okay. I'll run it. Over. Yeah. What, so when you mention agriculture, it's funny because like, like most people don't know how destructive it is you know, to the soil and to the habitat, and like it's the reason why we have armies and wars and shit. So when you tell people that, they don't fucking know. Like you, you it's like you said in your videos, we're taught that agriculture is a good thing and we build culture and all. And it's like no, it's bad. It's destructive, and it's why we have wars and why nature is being destroyed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the main thing about it is is it the big lie. The big lie behind our entire culture and civilization is runs across communists, capitalists, socialists, national socialists. The big lie is that civilization produces a surplus. It never did. It, it, you can, it looks like it produces a surplus because they have a grain surplus. It's false accounting. If, if you do a whole cost accounting to the ecology and to what future generations are going to pay, it runs at a deficit. And that's the big lie behind civilization. That's the dirty secret behind every fucking thing down to the last penny of interest you pay to the bank is that they're getting away with it because they've bamboozled people into thinking there's a surplus and it's not. It's just false accounting. So so what's what nature is going to bring us to a whole cost accounting. And that's yep. that's what we're heading for. So we cannot cook the books anymore. We've done 5,000 years of cooking the books and we can't do it any longer because nature, we, we could always kick the can down the road. We could basically move the agricultural footprint, you know, pretend that cities were green because we didn't look at their com consumption and emission footprints and all of this stuff. We could, we could always push it onto future generations, claim a technology dividend. Now all of that stuff is coming to an end because yeah. people are saying, uh, this is it. Now you're getting to the point where you need to pay the bill. And we say, but we can't. The future generations are supposed to do it. Tech's supposed to do it. And you say, well, tech isn't going to do it because people stopped getting worthwhile patents for anything years ago, and uh, there are no more future generations. We are. We are. It's the end of the game. It's pay up. Now we need to pay the bill for this fucking party. Yeah, exactly. It's like, um, yeah, the, the uh, lie of surplus. It's like uh, we were in debt the minute we put pl the plow to soil because the complexity in ecosystems and the abundance of, you know, life and the ability to make a living in the ecosystem was completely destroyed because of that. Yeah. Well, yeah. What the the main thing that stops people facing the truth is they don't want to accept how little we have, how little the I don't want to say surplus in nature is, but how little we can sustainably take out of nature. So, in other words, if you allow all the birds and the bees and the ecosystem and stuff around the fruit tree that you need to survive on as a chimp. The birds are going to take their pick. The bees are going to take their pick. There's not a lot left. There's like two peaches on a fucking fruit tree. Yep. So, so the fraud that we're doing is saying we're taking the whole fruit tree and it all goes to us. And basically, worse than that, we're saying we'll take the best 
get a huge profit out of it, Whole Foods market, and the rest goes in the bin. And he's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Like, uh, it, it the could, budget it, is two peaches, and you've taken the whole fucking lot. <laughs> like, yeah, this exactly. is not going to end well. Exactly. It kind of reminds me uh, when, back when I was more of a leftist. I read that bit in Marx where he talked about the metabolic rift between humans and nature. And it's like thinking about it now, if humans take even one fucking inch more than nature produces, you're unsustainable. Yeah, but 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 the margin for us to survive on is very little. We're talking like a couple of you know antelope, a couple of buffalo out of the herd every now and again. We if you look at it in terms of an intact ecosystem in most global ecosystems you're talking one person per per square mile it's that that in in a productive uh wholesome habitat so if you want yeah, to see it's... how far we've overshot is is go and have a look how much arable land there is for 7.8 billion yeah. people at one kilometer yeah because uh one of the things uh because one of the things that's really cool i noticed is like humans are kind of a lot like wolves in a way we're kind of pack hunting primates and we sort of see we need uh, we it need the perfect. um yeah we need the equivalent territory for our pack or our tribe to survive in the ecosystem but we don't just hunt the herds you know we uh we pick berries and stuff so but there's not enough ecology for everyone to do that now unfortunately well, yeah, have a look at Britain. So 65 million people, that they can feed half the population at about one hectare per person. Now, that's done with conventional agriculture. It's not sustainable. It just means they, they're borrowing from the future. They'd have to, we're talking about putting fertilizer down, you know, using high-tech equipment, fossil fuels to, to plow it. That's not sustainable. So, so when the Great Famine comes, uh, and Britain is completely cut off. Britons are going to have to find, you know, 50% of them can't be fed. The rest, you have to have their nutritional input cut by half. Then they still not sustain. Back into Ireland. What? You, you I said go, they're not come back into Ireland. <laughs> yeah, but even in Ireland, it's not sustainable because what um, you have to go back to is like you, you would have to we... repopulate the forests. You would have to re repopulate. Yeah. Um, you know, no, but in, in Ireland, there's, there's enough for the moment. The population is so small in comparison to the soil that, I mean, you know, it's not impossible to survive without the outside world on an island as it is now. But the population is very small. So you can, you can, you could imagine a scenario where there would be no boats, no planes, no nothing, but you could still uh, eat and pick and eventually kill enough to. Live. Yeah, but think think of Britain. But not Britain. That's why yeah. I said that they're not coming. To us again. It's, like, it's, it's like, guys, you the, the, there's a disaster coming of monumental of course, proportions, is. and Britons are right in the crosshairs, thinking, of oh, refugee problem. No, you know, there's going to be hundreds of millions of refugees, and like, yeah, you, you assholes, not brown people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and one of the things that's interesting about talking about all this stuff is like I bring that up, and then they're like, you know, with the agriculture and stuff, like you, you got, you're saying you have to live like animals. I'm like, what part of your brain is making a division between us and other animals? <laughs> You'll be lucky to live like an animal. <laughs> exactly. Like it's literally like a privilege to not have to live with a phone. If you're, <laughs> if you're living with a, like a phone, you know you're a fucking slave. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me talk about Bitcoin then. <laughs> well, maybe we should end there. <laughs> it's been a long Bitcoin. Night. It, it's like Bitcoin, aka bullshit coin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like Bitcoin. Oh my god. <laughs> but Bitcoin is another is another one of these placebos that are stopping people waking up. Oh. All right. Well, on that happy night. <laughs> <laughs> no hope left in this group, which I'm pleased to say. Uh, job done. Uh, job done. <laughs> uh, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Mike, be careful when you get up and when you get up because you could fall back there in the precipice. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll make sure to climb down. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had to escape the city and now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One way or the other.
Exalted Heights. <laughs> Exalted Heights. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of reminds me of uh, a song of the Summer King. One will rise higher, one will see farther. His wing beats will part the storm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, just, just be careful well, about the, the ground below. You've got to watch out how far you've got to yeah, well, as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, the ground below <laughs> might be an inferno. Yeah. <laughs> all these uh, Elon Musk type, type Icaruses are really going to like smack the ground hard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like from uh um uh from that movie Planet of the Humans. He said that like humanity is poised uh for, for a fall from an uh, unimaginable height. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it, it pays to go back to ancient Greece. They we're just rehashing what they figured out in ancient Greece. So. No, no, no big prizes for being smart in our generation. We just got stupid and stupid, and our brains are shrinking. We, we lost a tennis ball size sort of neural matter yeah. in the last 20,000 years. We're just dumbing down daily, daily, daily. Yeah, it, it's because our brains aren't making the, the map of our environment anymore. That's why oh, okay. we're we, supposed we, to make. Yeah, That's what happens that, to yeah. domesticates. We, we, we have done the worst thing you can do to an animal, and we did it to ourselves. It's yeah, it, it, it's like how... Even wolves have bigger brains than dogs. It's uh, because they're making a, a map of their habitat. That's why, it, like, also predator animals like hunters have bigger because they have to make a more complex map than, um, um, mm -hmm. like, herd animals like deer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's the fate of domesticates to, to get uh, nothing good comes out of domestication and and their life. Uh, their life experience is diminished in ours is too. Yeah, exactly. The joy, and the joy of living too. Yeah. The joy of living. Yeah, that that depression you feel is is your brain saying, I need the neurons back. I <laughs> civilization <laughs> shouldn't be lobotomy. I, I I can't experience joy with half my brain missing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's fucking true. <laughs> Don't ever look at the rat experiment where they have all these oh. rats in skin cages and they, all the guys with it, the rats would dope themselves to death. They just gave them like an expansive rat world where they could, you know, behave like rats and they stopped taking drugs. And, Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's uh, being cut off from the world, and mm -hmm. it's all replaced with this this dead simulation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's I was like talking the living to... world and not the dead world. That's the the thing. Yeah, I was because talking. Everybody's to... fighting for the the dead world. The, yeah. yeah, the symbolic. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Sophie and Mike earlier before you got on. Um, before I came to your work. Uh, when I learned, you know, came out of my leftist phase and learned that, you know, Soviet Union, all that was destroying nature. My whole thing was like in my journey, figuring out how do we not destroy nature? And then I read books like Dialectic of Enlightenment and then and Baudrillard, Simulac and Simulation. And that was when I co concluded we're fucked because we're so divorced from our reality now and our culture. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, a ne necroptocy, ne necroptocy. So it's basically we all those things, you know, solar panels and machines and AI. They dead things. And we, we made yeah. a fetish out of dead things. Yeah. And now well, on that, they're fighting for dead things. They're fighting for solar panels. They're fighting for geoengineering, and so they're fighting for for more zombie, dead technology. And you got to fight for life. The, yeah, for life, not dead. Thing. Yeah, it's like uh, Lewis Mumford called cities necropolises. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, fucking ne necropolis. We live in the necropolis. Well, anyway, let's let's necropolis out and. Uh, All right. <laughs> Sorry, I I, I I I mischievously monkey brained you into more. <laughs> 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 That's great. Yeah, <laughs> but 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 I'll stop being mischievous and let you go now. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, great to talk, everybody. Yeah, nice talk. All yeah, right. be safe out there. Yeah, be safe. Okay, get Bye -bye. out in nature. <laughs>